Hello and welcome to this very interesting discussion at the intersection of AI and software engineering that we call AI for code. And I'm here today with my colleague and friend, Diego, a key industry analyst who has been a pioneer in this area to bring this discussion front and center for our colleagues and for developers around the world. So Diego, welcome. Thank you very much, Richard. Great to be here. I think it'll be great, Diego, if you really bring this topic um, home in terms of what is really exciting about it from a industry uh, analysis point of view. Why has this become so important uh, more recently, but going forward, why is this such a critical topic? Yeah, so I guess uh, it all boils down to why talk about AI and the intersection of AI with uh, um, writing applications or writing code, as uh, Ruchir uh, said? Well, there's three main big reasons. One is the demand for building more new uh, and great applications is not going to diminish going forward. It's increased and it's going to be increasing much more with digital, with organizations trying to move faster from uh, to, to introduce more digital in their organization, right? Everybody talks about digital acceleration. Well, you can only achieve that if we build more applications. So there's a high demand, very high demand of building new applications. That's one. Number two, um, from another perspective, is um, as, a, as the University of Cambridge uh, did this research to find out that we're spending more than 50%, developers are spending more than 50% of their time fixing and making the code work which kind of equates all to around $312 billion. That's only on Linux, Unix. If you look at other ecosystems, Microsoft, .NET, et cetera, that number is just gonna be much, much bigger. So we're, we're spending a lot of money still writing and fixing the code that we write, right? So there's lots of quality problems. And third, we can't ignore legacy. Uh, actually, everything, almost everything we do today touches a legacy system, perhaps. And a lot of that legacy is written in COBOL. And if you look into the financial services industry, it's running very important core operational processes. 85% uh, of ATM machines touch uh, when you click up, when you swipe your card is going to touch perhaps on a back end written in COBOL. Uh, 60 to 80% of the transactions depend on COBOL writing. There's over between 200 and 250 billion lines of code that uh, Router uh, estimated around still existing. And also that Realtors estimates that's a, more or less a 1 million, uh, num 1 million COBOL developers. Uh, you know, COBOL is a 58 year language, it's old. And so they're, 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 actually I think that number is kind of cautiously high. But I did just some very simple math. I took the cautious number of 200 instead of 250 billion. I took the optimistic number that there's, a, well, there's 1 million uh, you know, COBOL programmers. If you just divide the two uh, simple math division, you'll find out that each COBOL programmer has 200,000 lines of code to maintain. That's a lot. I developed software and I know that that's a lot to maintain for each COBOL. Yeah. Now, those are the three big reasons, big issues in the industry, right? And uh, But there's also more happening, which is writing code. I was, you know, when I started uh, being a developer years back, it was much simpler. I know I you know, was a begin, wrote the code, end. Today, it's nothing like that. There's lots of technologies that are popping up every other week or month, serverless, event-driven, microservices, APIs, writing, you know, building with Agile and DevOps and Dev Security Ops. A developer needs to be a superhero. And we talk about cognitive overload for developers because there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to to, 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 to know in order to write good, uh, good code. So it's becoming more complex as well. Now, on the other side, we are trying to make things a bit easier as well, which is there's this you know, trend of low code, no code uh, uh, tools and environments that will allow, allow and enable business people to write simple applications. Now, that kind of shifts the problem somewhere else, which is, first of all, there's not gonna be enough of them anywhere anyway. But secondly, when you're really doing something at the enterprise level, complex enough, they all end up uh, extending out and reaching out to having to write some code and going back to the previous problem that we just talked about. At the end of the day, you have to do some coding as well. And so 
the problem is not going to be entirely fixed with just low code and no code and so-called citizen developers, which are business people that write code. And by the way, AI might contribute to that as well, but that's kind of anticipating some of the things that we're going to be talking about. So the question is correctly, right? AI is doing a lot of things today. There's lots of people adopting AI for business processes, for business operations. Can it also, can it also help us in the business of writing code? And, um, and so basically, uh, we in Forrester have been writing, I've been writing some research around this for the last two years. And with my colleague in 2021, we wrote about an emerging technology talking about AI rights enterprise code. And uh, we, were, we came up with this pretty bold prediction 2022, which is we think that by the end of next year, nearly all development tools will include an AI bot that will be helping developers, developer teams, building code. Uh, what exactly that is? Well, that's what the conversation today is going to be with Ruchir. So I, I think all that kind of gives, you know, the common, the, the, the basis for for justifying and for um, for basically uh, sharing why we think AI is, is why the AI for code is a very important topic today. Thank you. Um, this was a wonderful introduction to you know, it, the topic for AI for code, why it has become more relevant than ever before. But I think you, you very rightfully predicted uh, that AI will augment every development process that we entail in software today. Uh, but maybe you can you know, peel the onion a little bit regarding what, what is behind those predictions, what led you to those predictions as well, and, and we can start the conversation from then on and, and see uh, you know, what is going to happen as we move forward, what are the leading indicators of it, and how long it might take. Yeah, basically when we started writing about the emerging technology, I was looking for prior art, right? The, there, the, the um, being able to um, use and leverage AI for for code um there's a lot of prior art that has happened things that we've seen happening and we captured uh, in the last few years uh, one of them is for example using artificial intelligence for improving the way we test so companies like apply tools came up with what we call visual testing on the web visually testing applications for mobile apps uh, mabel is another interesting example of uh, prior art that augments tester automation capabilities but there's also prior arts in terms of research uh, that uh, and and small startups that have built um, interesting prior art like uh, Bayou that generates APIs, for example, idioms, uh, or Deep Code, which improves code but also generates unit test cases. Uh, GPT-3 was an example that generated from a description a web uh, application. And so there was a number of examples of existing prior art. And then came the big announcement that IBM did a couple of years back or last year, which was the AI for Code project, as well as the Microsoft the GitHub uh, Copilot. All these things together you know, made, made us uh, come to the conclusion that, OK, this is now moving from the labs into the mainstream. And we'll be, you know, of course, we are at the beginning of this very long journey. It's going to be very exciting. Oh, thank you. And I think you, as you started to elude, um, one of the things that we focused on um, in you know, the last several years of our journey, um, it was obviously clear to, to everybody. Over the last decade, it's been said, and I think Anderson Horvath said it uh, in 2009, the software is eating the world. We are a decade later, software has eaten the world. And we are at the beginning of AI is eating software. And, and we believed uh, when we started on this journey for AI for code that, you know, just like software has eaten the world, AI will eat software. And, and it's the intersection of these two very powerful technologies which will result in a massive shift in developer productivity. As you are saying, new technologies are popping up every day. And, AI to be able to augment every aspect of software development life cycle becomes extremely critical. And you know, it resulted in the project that we fondly call now Project CodeNet. Um, and 
as we were looking at things, it was clear that the latest incarnation of AI incorporated three major, uh, I would say, pillars. Uh, obviously, it's the data, massive amount of data that came together, um, which, on top of which, new algorithms were innovated. And because of very large amount of data and these complex algorithms, one needed very complex and very powerful hardware as well. And this sort of trifecta of, if I may say, um, data, algorithms, and hardware, compute, combined together, snowballed into these massive innovations. And in fact, I would say, if, if I were to just pick one of these categories, uh, which was critical in the beginning, was the data itself. You know, it's said that you know, there is no AI without data. And that took us to the point where we said, what is, you know, what is the data? Just like ImageNet was the data for um, you know, really snowballing AI into a massive societal disruption um, and, and helping society improve on things from healthcare to climate uh, analysis to, uh, to drug development and so on. You know, what is the data source for AI for code area? And you know, we, we developed CodeNet, which is this massively large data set of roughly around half a billion lines of code um, written in 55 different programming languages with you know, all kinds of problems from simple to complex um, and so on. And I think this was the one that caught the community, um, you know, really, I would say it got it very excited uh, in terms of having significant innovations and improvement. So we put that data source out there in the open as well, and it's the largest data source of its kind. And along with it, we also, as you said, you know, one of the announcements that we did uh, uh, earlier in the year, um, we also introduced some of the key algorithms that went with it as well, and we continue to roll things out as we move forward. Um, so, you know, I just wanted your opinions on, on what you think might be implications of projects like Project CodeNet and, and others that the community is developing. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm basically seeing, you know, two main, uh, two main important, very important threads. One is AI helps a developer, a, a, you know, becomes a pair programmer with a developer, right? So therefore I'm writing my code and I'm getting help from, a, from, from AI to write the best code and do it faster and do it better with high quality. It's helping me search maybe for, uh, code similarities, and uh, that uh, maybe also tells me that, uh, you know what, this piece of code doesn't look like yours, but it's doing exactly the same thing, and it's more efficient. Use it. Which So so AI for developers. The other important approach is more enterprise level or team-wise, supporting a team. And you guys know, you know, I, for especially the AI for code and a lot of the work that uh, I've seen you guys been doing, is actually helping the enterprise now you know, migrate, for example. Modernization is a big topic. Everybody has this legacy we talked about. How do you bring that, uh, that uh, old uh, uh, legacy, which it doesn't have to be COBOL, it could be also Java. You know, uh, technology that we used five years ago is legacy today. So how can we support those teams at the enterprise level go faster? And I think that's where your, you know, especially IBM's uh, uh, AI for Code sits, and and maybe Rucher, you can, you can explain. You know, there's this. I mentioned GPT three, right? I mentioned this approach of GPT three using a huge amount of data, being able and you know that GitHub uh, uh, acquired the rights to use uh, and uh, you know to build Copilot based on, on uh, on on uh, on on all that data. What's, you know, maybe you can, you can tell us a bit why you think AI for code is different. What is different in it? How different do you see those two approaches? But, but definitely in terms of besides, you know, addressing the developer and addressing the team, but within that, what's the difference between using something that is leveraging all that data coming from GPT-3 or the AI for code using, you know, the, co the, the, the curated amount of data that, um, that, uh, that you use? Yeah, ex excellent question and excellent point, I would say. Um, so, so let's see at the similarity. Uh, let's first actually just at a very high level talk about, you know, 
transformer models like GPT-3, which you know, really le learn in an unsupervised fashion. Um, the way technology is today from a GPT-3 point of view is they treat code as a language. Just like there's human language, English, Spanish, French, German, you know, others, there is machine language. Code is a form of a language and they treat code as a language. You know, it's got symbols and, and it's got a syntax and, and so on. Now, this is where the state of the art of transformer models is, which is basically learning the symbols, predicting what might come next. This is sequence prediction actually. Uh, however, I think there are similarities between human language and machine language, such as code, but there are differences as well. And I would say there are two main differences that make the area of AI for code very exciting. Now, obviously, computer science has been innovating in the area of programming languages for long, you know, several decades now. And significant amount of innovations have been built in program analysis. Now, what are the, you know, I would point out two main differences, as I said, which are, you know, obviously human language and machine language is similar in some ways that both are symbolic, but they are different from one code is a, you know, I would say code is executable. Unlike human language, which is not executable, I can give code an input and it will give me an output. And you can observe that behavior, you can keep on giving it inputs and you can keep on getting outputs, which makes the learning much more powerful if I have access to that behavior. Like if I have access to observing an application in real life and acting on data in real world, and I can observe its outputs, that gives me additional learning than just treating machine language as a language only. So that's, that's really one aspect of it. And, and the other aspect I would, I would really say is code can be compiled into a, what we call intermediate representation or a graph representation. This is the work of compilers, software compilers. You can take a machine language, you know, any machine language, it can be compiled into a underlying, what is known as controlled data flow graph also known as syntax parse trees, there are various representations of it, but fondly we call it intermediate representation, which is very powerful because on the basis of which you can rationalize across different languages, I would say, which gives us very powerful mechanism to learn across different languages as well. And these are two main differences that enable us to, to make the area of, of AI for code much more powerful than transformer models only as an example, just treating code as a language only, because code is, yes, code is a language, but it, it is much more than a language. Um, and because of the progress that has been made over the decades in terms of um, program analysis and finding the right intermediate representation and how to understand the dynamic behavior of the code, we firmly believe no, the, if I may say the legacy actually needs to be combined with the latest and the greatest of AI together to give rise to this new area of AI and code intersection of AI for code to be able to make significant progress in much more efficient learning than what we, we've been able to do so far. So, you know, it's interesting when you treat, uh, when you look at languages, you, you would think that um, one difference between human language and programming language is that programming languages follow a precise structure, right? I mean, human language, we can say things in many different ways. We can program an algorithm in many different ways, but you have to follow the syntax of the and the grammar that the language has. So my question is, is it easier or more difficult to, uh, because, you know, natural language, we've been struggling to really get natural language to a point where semantically we can hit, we can have a computer speak and hear, listen, and talk perfectly and understand all the different nuances of the language. It's, it's kind of hard. We're getting, it's getting better, but it's kind of hard. Well, how harder or less harder is it to do this with programming language? I would actually give maybe, maybe both answers on this, Diego, which is in some ways it is easier because if I may say the grammar, the syntax is very well defined. Uh, of course, you can code a problem with multiple different algorithms, but 
So either the code is right or the code is not right. Uh, there's no ambiguity between that. Um, so precision of programming languages is in some ways makes it easier. On the other hand, it makes it harder because if you generate code as an example, there is no such thing as it's kind of right. Well, there is no such, it's not kind of right. Either you are right or you are wrong actually. And this is what makes it harder because it's like finding a needle in a haystack. You know, there is one right answer of it and if you don't kind of, it's not like you land in the ballpark and it's okay. Um, and that makes it much harder as well because you need to be much more precise and in fact you brought up the point of enterprises. Uh, I would say enterprises need consistency. Um, and where you know, a lot of the state of the art of transform, transformer models today is, it, it is at, at a place where it may wow you many times, like you type something in English, it may, it may generate a code, and wow, I think this is really cool, AI can do this, it can generate the code for me, but it is not consistent, and enterprises need consistency. I'm not gonna use something until I can trust on that process repeatedly, that yes, it's gonna help me because otherwise it is entertaining, but is not helping my productivity. And this is exactly what is needed from the point of view of, you know, as, as we said, consistency makes it harder as well because there is, a, there is one right answer for, you know, kind of that implementation or that syntax made, makes it much more um, narrower and precise as well. So hopefully I think that, that teases out the point that, uh, that we've been trying to differentiate, you know, Okay, exactly what is different on AI for code and where the latest of the, of the technology is. Uh, one question, Diego, I wanted to ask, and I know you've written a lot about it, um, in terms of, you, know, you brought up the point of debugging. And there's been a lot of focus on you know, AI for code techniques and code generation as an example. I think I just mentioned the point of kind of wowing, that you can write something in English and it can generate some code for you. But there is no point generating code, at least not in the enterprises, and I, I think it holds true even for academia and others as well, if you can test that code. Uh, whether you are modernizing the code, doesn't matter what you are doing to generate a, even a you know, couple of lines of code, you write some test to generate that, uh, to test that code, and this was the aspect I mentioned earlier on, um, on execution behavior, like code has execution behavior. And I know you have thought a lot about it and written a lot about it. Um, would love to get your perspective on it. Yeah, so um, in the software development life cycle, when I started this research four or five years back, I looked at the entire software development life cycle, right? From analysis, design, development, test, integrate, deploy. And I actually did research pulling it out, you know, sending it out and, and kind of finding out where would you apply? Where are you going to be, you know, in the following years? Are you going to be trying to leverage AI in, in that software development uh, life cycle. And it turned out that testing was one of the very hot areas. As a matter of fact, uh, two years or uh, three years ago, I started writing more research, digging down into how can we use uh, how can we use AI for software testing? And the reason why we, you know, there was a lot of focus, I found a lot of focus on this is because as you, you know, we all know with Agile and DevOps, testing and quality has become a first class citizen much more important in the software development life cycle process. It's always been a first class citizen, but now these days we can't, you know, it's a must, it's a must do. So, so how can, um, and, and so what are the, I found many use cases actually. The biggest and the most important one is, well, can we be more intelligent in the way we test? So in other words, if you think about it, you know, many people have been thinking about testing and automation, especially of testing. It's like ruthless automation. Let's automate everything. We've got lots of computing power. Let's, you know, just automate as much as we can and execute all the automation just to make sure that we cover all the tests. Well, not really, because first of all, building those test cases and automating it costs and it's hard. And secondly, we don't, we can be much more smarter with it. And as a matter of fact, the use cases that I've been finding out is AI can help and, uh, you know, you, you can now optimize what should I be testing? If there is a change, what are the related tests that I need to have, make sure that are executed and passed based on that change? 
of the code. Um, also, what uh, um, what tests should I execute? You've got lots of regression tests, perhaps, and you make a change again. Which automation should I execute? Should I execute everything simply because I've got all that computing power? Well, guess what? Even if it's on the cloud, you're going to have to pay for it. So AI can help us actually optimize the automation, optimize what we automate, and also automize, uh, optimize what we execute. I mentioned visual application testing. Uh, basically, it's as if um, you know when you have these all these cool uh, uh, interfaces, and now you're deploying across uh, many different uh, web browsers, and uh, and you've got you know huge websites, and uh, suddenly you want to make a change that should be replicated all over your deployed applications on the web. How can you test everything? And you you have to you know have to with eyes and look at the different nuances and the changes of the maybe the style or uh, the color or um, or even you know the labels, name labels, and I'm and this is simple stuff, but it becomes very hard at, at a very large scale. So now you've got AI visual testing that can do that in a matter of seconds and find out exactly what the difference is, especially when you go and look at an application on the mobile app or on the browser. Um, there's a and and overall, it's really about optimizing the test strategy, as I said, which is what are the cool things i don't have a lot of time i've got constraints in terms of 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 money that i want to spend in that that amount of time how much can i what can i test where should i focus and the machine learning models have learned you know with all the data that we have in testing all the existing test cases all the bugs all the code enterprises can create models that will learn from those and tell them and give those suggestions in terms of which areas to focus on for the strategy so there's a whole series of actually use cases that we've seen now applied uh, from a services perspective, but also in the development tools, trying to increase uh, to increase the level of automation by decreasing the amount that we write because we're doing it in an optimal way. So well, that's actually wonderful, and I have, I have a very uh, actually uh, I have an example as well where to us it it became loud and clear how important that area is. It's actually on, you mentioned modernizing legacy code. And and we've been focused a lot on you know, COBOL to, to Java actually as a, as a language translation. But this was, as you mentioned, the legacy code doesn't have to be COBOL. This was actually Java. Uh, it, it was a, a large automotive client of ours, a mission critical application that they were trying to modernize $200 million asset for them. So it was really critical for their business. Um, 3,500 plus or so Java files written in Jaxby, SOAP, uh, Struts, and many different technologies over the last 10 years or so. Uh, a million lines of code. Um, and they were spinning their wheels for like a year actually on this and not able to understand what this code actually did. And you know, with our AI for code uh, effort specifically related to modernization, we got involved and we were able to, to uh, build, uh, you know, really understand code and to be able to build 25 plus or so microservices. They were trying to make it, you know, really uh, modernize it to a cloud native implementation. Uh, we were able to suggest partitions, analyze code, explain it as well, all within roughly around four weeks. Uh, so four weeks versus one year, um, just in terms of, you know, what value does AI provide? in terms of productivity boost and, and really getting the task done from in this case uh, for, uh, for modernizing legacy code. But the reason I mentioned the example is that you know, right after that, the client said, this is great, but I had my unit tests. All of that actually were there before. Uh, how do I, this has now generated code for me. Uh, how do I take this and now I want to really deploy it? How do you, I know all of this is correct because I have those tests over in this side, legacy tests as well, with, or, or, on top of which I did my releases. Um, how can AI help me in getting all of this over on the other side as well? So that it became loud and clear that you can't do code generation uh, despite tremendous value it might offer uh, without actually having proper testing. And in fact, in another area that became clear to us is you know, obviously security has been a lot more in, in, in uh, you know, really the uh, uh, central focus in many discussions these days. But AI to be able to detect vulnerabilities in software, because 
rarely is the development these days that somebody writes you know, massive lines of code from scratch. You are going on the web, finding something, there is an open source code here and there is you know, something, some code on Quora or Stack Overflow over there. You copy paste, you contextualize. Uh, it's a lot about integration and you know, you never know what vulnerabilities are lurking out where. Uh, yes, national vulnerability database covers the libraries, but it's not covering all these forums actually. And AI to be able to help us find the vulnerabilities as well, you know, in addition to bugs and others, I think that's another area which emerged as, you know, as we hear more and more for clients. Uh, I think there are some areas that are emerging as very important as we move forward in this, uh, in this uh, uh, journey. Another question I just wanted to ask as we, as we wrap it up, um, you know, uh, from your point of view, first, you know, any other concrete examples you want to highlight uh, in terms of uh, get, getting the value, and and to close it off, I would say, and we can have a very brief discussion on what do we think, like enterprises should be doing to prepare. This is like, you know, okay, give me the take-home point. What should we be doing to prepare for the tsunami that is coming? on the intersection of AI and software engineering. Right, so I'm gonna mention quickly three things that I'm seeing. On one side, I'm seeing clients that are reaching out with briefings, with inquiries and uh, to kind of check their, the clients have their radar, their, their own roadmap, right, for looking at when they need to adopt technologies. And I'm seeing uh, large, large enterprises that are putting AI for code uh, in the roadmap, right? Over the next two to three years. And I actually, this was this was last year, but I think that needs to be accelerated now. But anyway, so clients are starting to put this in their radar screen. The second uh, concrete uh, example is, uh, is uh, on the testing of uh, using AI for testing is a very large bank here in Europe. I actually talked about this in the European, uh, at the European Forester Forum that used AI for uh, optimizing and improving the way they tested their five-star mobile application. Um, and they used, uh, you know, AI to basically, again, make sure that they tested in the amount of time they had, they optimized all the testing. Uh, and uh, this is a very successful five-star app, uh, which, uh, which actually we wrote in a big research talking about what are the banking applications in Europe that have uh, a top high user experience. This application ended up having a very high user experience uh, uh, um, uh, classification in, in, the, in, in the report that we wrote. There's also, uh, you know, big, very large enterprises like Intel, who's using, who's who generated in together with MIT. They also built a system that uh, did this code similarity and did some automated bug fixing, releasing that uh, last year. They started releasing it to their 2,000 developers. So, companies are starting to move into the into the direction of leveraging. Uh, on leveraging what's coming out from the research, but also that's being productized. And in the testing space, there are, I've got many examples uh, that that uh, that I that I can uh, can talk to, but we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to pause and stop for them. In terms of what we can do, I'll give my quick uh, you know recommendation of what I think is. First of all, I think that uh, uh, you know clients should really look at um, at uh, this uh, the opportunity of uh, um, introducing autonomous, let's call it autonomous coding or autonomous testing. Look around, uh, they work with partners, check with the partners. A lot of this is gonna come also from the vendors like yourself. If you're working with a vendor, I would recommend clients to reach out and ask them what they're doing in this space and actually starting to, you know, to leverage and experiment with that. Uh, I think that um, uh, the code, you, the unit test generation example you gave is, a, is also a great one because developers spend, you know, double, doubles their time to write the unit tests uh, besides for the coding. Um, and so, um, and so therefore, I think getting prepared for this, and it also means from an enterprise perspective is uh, getting much better in defining what we want the, you know, in formalizing what the system should be doing uh, which is kind of a specification, the input that can be given to these, uh, let's call them AI bots, so that, you know, th these are going to be trained by the vendors, are being going to be already, you know, trained by someone else, so that they can leverage them, start leveraging them for supporting and augmenting the developer, the development team and the developer itself. 
Uh, I think also AI, you know, things like um, CodePilot is another great example for developers to start getting, uh, even, even those that want to do low code, maybe with a CodePilot type can start coding in a language which is not necessarily too low code because the CodePilot can help them uh, show them how, you know, certain code can implement certain requirements. So there's, there's a few things I think that are very much, uh, you know, usable and leverageable today. Yeah, the, uh, one wonderful points, and I would say I think another area where I know a lot of enterprises are struggling, and that's really been their mission to modernize. And uh, you know, application modernization and AI. You know, there are tools available out there today, actually, that they can go and leverage, um, like Mono to Micro for IBM. Obviously, in terms of leading edge research. One thing I always suggest to all the clients is pick something, start small. You know, there is no silver bullet per se. Uh, this is a complex space, but fast progress is being made in this area. Pick a project, start small, whether it is in task testing. You know, we have another project actually called Conveyor, K-O-N-V-E-Y-O-R. You can go to conveyor.io and look at this lot more in application modernization area with our Red Hat colleagues. And you know, there's a project in there called Tackle and Tackle Test, which actually combines application modernization and testing uh, together. And that becomes actually extremely critical as we move forward in the enterprise journey for application modernization. So software development lifecycle, application modernization lifecycle, testing, use cases abound. But pick something, start small, keep following research, and, and I'm looking forward to the, to the progress that will take place in this area and looking forward to more discussions to come, Diego, between us as we uh, continue to move forward. Well, th thank you, Richard. I think I would just like to add, you, you touched on a very important aspect, uh, sorry, area. I would say, you know, right now, there's a lot of migration to the cloud that needs to be done. So your modernization example, I think, is, is a very important use case. Well, thank you, Diego, and uh, appreciate you joining us. Uh, this is a wonderful discussion and looking forward to many more to come. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.